All right. Uh, Erev Tov, everybody. Welcome to the uh, beginning of our new series on Sefer Melachim. A pleasure to uh, welcome back uh, someone we all know, Rabbi Nathaniel, Nathaniel Helfgott, Rav Nadi, of course, if I know him for many, many years. We'll start by introducing you in a way you're probably not generally introduced because one of my my uh, my students today said, was oh, that the Rabbi Helfgott in Camp Stone? I said, that's the Rabbi Helfgott <laughs> in Camp Stone. So Rabbi Nadi has been going to Campstone for many, many years where my kids have gone and uh, knows them so well. I'll, I'll say that one of the camp, uh, one of the people making Campstone what it is. Of course, he serves as a rabbi of um, Netibat HaShalom in Tinak and the head of the Department of Torah Shabbat Pen SAR. He's been organizing for many years the Yemei Iyun and Tanakh at uh, YCT, and it's really a pleasure to have him. And this is going to be sort of an ongoing series, as you all know, on Sefer Melachim. So bring your Tanakh, you have a Sefer Melachim handy. And of course, I'm holding, Rav, Rav Nadi is a, a, a prolific author, since we're doing on, on Tanakh, so I have here his book, Mikran Meaning, his articles on many collections on Tanakh, but he's all published much more. And uh, with that introduction, I think uh, we'll let you take it over and we look forward to, um, please God, a, a wonderful year of learning. Um, I, you'll, you know, tell me how many you want to encourage to speak up and how interactive we want to make it, but that will leave to you and uh, we'll see as we go along. Vakasha. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi Kelman. Um, and it's really wonderful to join uh, forces. Um, uh, this class um, is a continuation of uh, my weekly class uh, for my shul. Um, and I uh, approached Rabbi Kelman, who was so, uh, so forthcoming and so wonderful in accepting the idea that we could uh, connect forces um, and uh, and make it broader than just uh, my shul and the Teaneck community. I also want to say, as I always say when I speak for Torah Motion, Torah Motion is an amazing organization. Um, it's really a, a, um, a beacon of light in Toronto uh, in, and, and beyond that with Zoom, with so many classes and so many important um, topics that they've spoken about, not only straight Torah topics, but also they've they've dealt with some very difficult, challenging topics that we um, as Jews confront in the modern world and halacha confronts in the modern world. And so kol kavod to Rabbi Kelman. And I would also encourage everyone to, um, I would encourage everyone to uh, support Torah in Motion. Uh, all the programs that they run are free. Um, I think on Zoom, uh, and so, uh, but uh, life is not free. Uh, <laughs> As they say, Rev Natty, thank you for that. This was unplanned. Thank you, but uh, yeah. they're they're not free. We don't charge, but they're right. not free. But that's, they're not that, free. That's an important and, difference. <laughs> exactly, okay. and um, I really would encourage everyone who can to support uh, Torah in Motion. Um, okay, so tonight we're going to start um, our journey into uh, the Book of Kings, uh, Sefer Melachim. What you're going to need on a regular basis is a Tanakh. Um, sometimes I'll put uh, on my screen, I'll put uh, certain ta'im, certain passages uh, that I might want to emphasize, but you really need to follow along with a Tanakh. Um, so it can be in English and Hebrew. I'll try to translate uh, whatever I think, you know, what I'll try to translate any phrases that I use that are significant, uh, um, et cetera. So what I'd like to do, certainly in the first part of tonight's class, is to do a kind of overview of uh, the Book of Kings of Sefer Melachim um, and uh, address some very important issues in the context of the Book of Kings. And then we're going to go uh, in Yerts Hashem, uh, with whatever time remaining, we'll begin, we'll go right into chapter one, which we're not going to finish uh, tonight for sure, uh, but we'll go in, in that direction. Um, so the first thing that I want to do is I want to ask um, a, 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 a question. I want to ask a question, which is some people might say is a klutz kasha, um, is, a, is a silly question, but it's not really a silly question. So I would like to ask, uh, and uh, you know, people can unmute themselves and answer, um, uh, who was the first king of Israel? Who was the first king of the Jewish people? Shaul. So I heard Shaul, Shaul. King Saul. Okay. Any yeah, other? Hashem, Akadosh Baruch Hu. Akadosh Baruch Hu. God is your king. 
Moshe right? Rabbeinu. Certainly, uh, certainly Shmuel, uh, in the book of Samuel, Shmuel, uh, the prophet Samuel was very much against the whole notion of kingship. And he said, Hashem, whom I'll, you know, God is your king. What do you need a king for? Um, and uh, I heard somebody say the book, uh, Saul. I heard somebody say um, Moshe Rabbeinu, which is, of course, very fascinating because um, there is a rabbinic reading um, that Moshe was the first king. Uh, the Gemara in Shavuot, the first parak of Shavuot, has a tremendous amount of laws that we learn about kingship from Moshe. Uh, and if you look at the Parshanut, you look at the rabbinic and uh, medieval commentary on the verse which we just read on uh, Simchat Torah. Vayhi bishurun mel yachad yachad shifte Israel. So who's the Melech there? So is the Melech the Rabbono Shalom, God? Or is Vahibi Shurun Melech uh, Moshe Rabbeinu? So many of the Parshanim say Vahibi Shurun Melech is God, is, is Moshe. So Moshe could be the king, the first king. He went, he led them into war. He led them politically. He led them religiously. So maybe Moshe is the first king. Some people said Shaul is the first king. Could be. Certainly uh, he's the first king anointed by Samuel. One could say, we just, uh, you know, uh, we're, we just did Rosh Chodesh uh, yesterday. Today was the last day of, of the second day of Rosh Chodesh. This coming Motzei Shabbat, we are going to do a uh, our strange moon ritual, uh, Kiddush Levana, right? And uh, part of Kiddush Levana is we say, David Melech Yisrael, Chai Chai V'Kayam. So King David is the first king. So we have a whole range of kings. Saul, Moshe, God, um, David HaMelech. Gideon's son. Gideon's son tried to be, wasn't very successful. Yeah. In fact, he was a disaster. Uh, Avi Melech, uh, who called him, you know, the name, right? Gideon, uh, Gideon, Gideon uh, rejected the entreaties of the Jewish people to become king. And maybe if he would have accepted, things would have turned out better uh, in the history of uh, the Book of Shoftim. The Book of Shoftim is a disaster. Uh, as we know from the end of the book, uh, uh, we have rape, we have murder, we have civil war. The Book of Shoftim does not end on very pleasant notes. Um, so the question I'm asking is, so if the book, if the first kings of Israel are in, are either Moses or Saul or David HaMelech, why does this book begin with a chapter of King David on his deathbed and he's about to die? That's how it begins. It's a crazy thing. Why not, why not end the book of Shmuel with... Um, the death of Saul and begin the book of Kings with David being accepted as king at the beginning of Shmuel Bet. Would have been a perfect place to begin if you asked me, why does the book of Kings, Sefer Malachim, begin at the crazy place, at the end of the book, the end of the narrative of David. David's on his deathbed. Could have started much earlier in well, time. It's so, very hard to know when David started as king. He was anointed, and then there was a long period where he wasn't recognized as king. Six so and a half start right, the story. Right. So right. Six and a half years he wasn't recognized, but he was king of Judah. But by the beginning of Sefer Shmuel, he's recognized as king over all of Israel. It says it explicitly in Shmuel Bet. Perak Bet, Perak Gimel, he's accepted by all of Israel. So you'll say, okay, maybe there were still some, you know, loose ends. There's Avner Ben Ner, there's, you know, this one, there's that one. But by chapter seven, chapter eight, David is king and he's very successful. And he uh, is successful, you know, he reaches his zenith in chapter eight, nine. So it's very, very strange. So why does the Book of Kings, the author of the Book of Kings, begin uh, Sefer, um, 
Sefer Melachim with the death, basically, the death scene of David and doesn't begin in the middle of David's life or doesn't even begin with Saul, who could ostensibly, you could argue, is the first king. So, so I think the answer is very straightforward, but first we have to analyze what makes a king a king, right? What makes a king a king? Yeah. It's good to be the king, right? Mel Brooks, it's good to be the king. But what makes a king a king as opposed to leaders who are not kings? Because up until this point, we've had a lot of leadership in Am Yisrael. We had Moshe, we had Yoshua, we had the Shoftim, we had Shmuel, we had Saul. <laughs> so what makes a king a king? Absolute authority. Makes, what? Authority, absolute authority. Absolute authority. Or almost um, absolute. Almost. I'm sorry? Yes, absolute or almost absolute. <laughs> absolute authority. So he has more authority Except than others. I don't know. Um, Shoftim, many of the Shoftim seem to have had a lot of authority. Um, Devora seems to yeah, be. Hashem picks him. Hashem anoints him. Hashem picks him. But in, certainly no, in the uh, Shoftim. I think the people, the people have people to accept him. People have to accept him. People have to accept him. Okay. Right, right. But I, I think the difference is that the, he, his kids automatically become king. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, okay. And now that's we're why getting... it starts with this, with his death, because that's really established. Uh, ah, very kingship. good. Okay. So let's let's unpack what is a king as opposed to, let's say, a shofate or a nasi. Okay. So first of all, again, let's let's outline all the different qualities then that makes sense the, the distinction between a, a shofate and a king. Okay, so a shofate, one thing about a shofate is that he's tribal, correct? If you look at the, at, at the book of Shoftim, again, there's not a class in the book of Shoftim, but if you went to the book of Shoftim and you'll, if you added up all the Shoftim, you'll see that almost every tribe gets a shofate. There's a shofate from Ephraim, there's a shofate from Menashe, meaning when you look at the end of the book of Shoftim of Judges, it turns out that regionally, turns out that there's a shofate from almost every part of Am Yisrael. And the shoftim are not national, right? Dvora is up in the north, and she's fighting battles that relate to enemies in the north. She doesn't gather, she's not able to gather everybody. In fact, she complains about it. Even the local shvatim, not all of them came Ezra Israel, as she talks about it, Ezra Giborim, as she talks about in that in that famous um, in that famous song of Devora. Um, Shimshon is a shofate of the south of Judah, and you know if anyone's ever gone on the road near Beit Shemesh, that's where Shimshon hung out. Bein Sira, Bein Sora, Ubein Eshtaol, right on that road, road thirty-eight. Uh, today in Israel, uh, when you come down from Gush Etzion and you make a, a, a right and you uh, want to go to uh, to uh, Route 1 from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. So Shoftim are tribal, they're not national. A king, the whole idea of a king is that he's not just a tribal leader. So as you said correctly, someone said, when David was just the king of Yehuda, uh, so he's not really a full king. The whole idea is that you have a united monarchy. You have a united, the king can gather together all of the people in a way that a shofate uh, doesn't have that ability and doesn't have that reality. Number two, a king has a standing army. Um, if you look at the book of Shoftim, Shoftim, you constantly have to be migayes. You constantly have to draft and get together a hodgepodge of of people to fight this battle or fight that battle. Um, but a king, especially the ideal king, um, has a chief of staff, right? An Avner Ben Ner, a Yoav Ben Shruya, you have, right? Shaul had a very small cabinet. The only minister he really had was the minister of, of war, um, of Avner Ben Ner. Uh, David has an expanded cabinet, but you start to have a standing army. And of course, that reaches its zenith with Shlomo HaMelech, where he has a standing army of hundreds of thousands of people who are have to be fed and taken care of and barracks and housed and all that stuff and trained and given weapons, et cetera, et cetera. But number three, as Boaz said correctly, the most important element 
of a king is that a king is hereditary. That a king is not a flash in the pan. A shofet is a flash in the pan. First there's Devorah, then there's Gidon, then there's whatever, there's Boaz, the Ivtsan, there's Shamgar. This is all different people. And sometimes you'll get a really great shofet or shofetet like Devorah. And sometimes you'll get a really, uh, a person like Yiftach, who's not exactly, you would give him shishi on Yom Kippur. Okay? You don't get, you get a whole different slew of people. Now, on the one hand, not having a hereditary um, kingship means that you look for the most charismatic person. And, and God hopefully chooses that charismatic person. But sometimes you can be in trouble. Let's say there's nobody around who can be so charismatic. Let's say there's not great people to help you. It can, it can lead to a lot of instability. It can lead to a lot of unsettledness amongst the populace that you don't have a clear cut uh, path. Hereditary kingship, hereditary leadership, on the one hand, it has a lot of drawbacks because what happens if the sun is not so great, right? You look at the whole, you know, interesting discussion recently with the death of Queen Elizabeth and now King Charles becoming the king, right? We don't really have kings today, except for in Britain. We like, you know, we're, we're very democratic, but in a world, so there's a whole machlokas, right? Will, does Charles have the same um, attraction, the same gravitas, the same status as Elizabeth? Clearly not. Um, so, but he's the king, he's the heir. So on the one hand, it's not, not always the greatest thing. On the other hand, the people who come to Shmuel, they want a king, they want stability to lead us into battle. Everyone around us has kings, they have a stable government, they have everything. So when there is clear that there's going to be a hemshechiyut, when there's going to be a continuity, that's when there's kingship. When there is a house, just like in English, we say the house of Windsor or the house of this or the house of that. When you have a bayit, when you have a passing on, then you have a kingship. And so it makes perfect sense that the book of Kings begins dafka at the moment of David's death and the fight for who will become the next king. Will it be Adoniyahu or will it be Shlomo HaMelech? Because this is the point where David, with all his greatness, with all of his ability to unify everybody and overcome all of the schisms within his family and his life, but the question is, at this moment, is when it becomes Malchut Beit David and not just David. Saul was a king, but it was a flash in the pan. In the end, he was just a glorified, you know, it, it had no Hem Sheikhiyut. Yonatan died. Ish Boshet ultimately died. Mifi Boshet died. There was no Hem Sheikhiyut to his, there was no continuity to his reign. And so, in hindsight, it turns out that Shaul and Shmuel, who was a kind of you know, prophetic semi-king. He leads them into battle in chapter seven of Shmuel Aleph. Uh, but his children can't continue him, even though he might want his children to continue him. His children, there's no him sheikhiyut. Yoshua's children, no him sheikhiyut, no continuity. Saul, no continuity. David is the first one who not only has a unity of, at least a tenuous unity of the entire Eretz Yisrael entire uh, context of what of, of the whole of Am Yisrael, of all the Shvatim, but he also has continuity. And so the book of Kings begins at the moment of the transfer of power, because then there is a bite. And I want to make this clear. This is already hinted at in the book of Samuel. Let me see if I can put in the book of Samuel. If we go back, well, let me first, sorry, let me first, <clears throat> okay, if everyone can go back to Samuel 2, Shmuel Bet, isn't this opening for me? Sorry. 
If everyone goes back and then I will, um, if you look, if you go to um, Shmuel Bet, Perek, Shmuel Bet, uh, Perek, Zayin, uh, which is a very famous Perek, um, where David is pretty set and David decides that it's time to, um, David decides that it is time to build the Beit HaMikdash in Shmuel, Perek, Zion. And now let me put this, um, go back to this uh, before I share. Okay, sorry. Let me make this small. Make this small. Okay, so now let me make it big again and then share. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we got to do it this way. Okay, sorry. Getting, getting my ability to go back. Can I share with this? You should be able to share. You're the... Oh, okay. oh, do you see it? Yes. Okay, Baruch Hashem. Okay, thank you. Sorry, just getting used to it again. Okay, let me just uh, make this. Small. I mean, it's very, you have it extremely big, so we only see, you know, a few psukim. I know, I know, that's that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, So yeah. this is a famous parak, the famous chapter where David is living in his house. Again, the key word in this entire, um, in this entire chapter in Shmuel Bet is David HaMelech Yoshev Beveito. And God has taken care of all his enemies. And the king says to the prophet, Natan, I'm sitting in this beautiful house, in this house full of arazim, full of, 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 of cedar wood. And the Aaron of God is, 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 in a, is, is you know, intense. And Natan says, do whatever you want. You want to build a house? Build a house, which is an interesting parenthetically. It shows you that sometimes prophets get things wrong. If they're not directly told by God and they just use their intuition, just like rabbis and politicians and newspaper pundits can get things wrong, prophets also can get things wrong. They're not perfect, especially when they haven't been communicated directly from God. So Natan thinks it's a great idea, David. Go, go for it. You're going to build me a house? So before we continue reading, so everybody knows on this Zoom that David is not allowed to build the Beit HaMikdash. Why is David not allowed to build the Beit HaMikdash according to the book of Samuel? Why can't David build the base of Mikdash? The reason isn't given in Samuel. The reason that we think about is always given in um, Divrei Hayamin, that he has got it on his hands. So, so you got it half right, <laughs> so to speak. But the here it's just because that God, God doesn't The reason that David uh, can't build the base of Mikdash in the, in the book of Chronicles is because Shlomo HaMelech says that God said to my father that you know, that your hands are full of blood, that you were involved in bloody issues, bloody, either because he had to kill a lot of people, he had to kill people, he had to go to war, and the Beis Amikdash represents peace. But it doesn't say that here. What does it say here? So now let's share the screen again. What does it say here in the book of Shmuel? So it's very clear that there's a play on the word bayit here. Ki ashav ha-melech beveito, he wants to build I'm sitting in a Beit Arazim. God says to him, you want to build a bayit? I never was in a house from the time that I left Egypt. I was I was in a temporary dwelling. And I never said to you, I took you out of the field from being a shepherd and I was with you and I have, and nothing will happen. And now God says, 
ולמיום אשר צוויתי שופטים על עמי ישראל, ואני יכולתי לך מכל אביך. ויגיד לך השם, כי בית יעשה לך השם. God says, I want you to know, I'm not interested in you building a bait for me. I'm telling you that I am going to build a bait for you, but not a house of Arazim, not a house of cedar, but a house, a lineage. Ki bait ya'aselech Hashem. Ki yimlu yamecha, your days will end. V'shachavta tavotecha, v'akimot yitzarcha charecha. And I will establish his melucha. Who? Yivne bayit lishmi. Bechonanti et kisei mamlachto ad ulam. When you have a son, and I have established his melucha in a way that there is stability, then you can build a house. You cannot build a house which represents stability of God, God's presence in the am, when you don't yet have stability in your politics, in your ability to be in this land. In Shoftim, it was constantly, you know, are you going to be uprooted? Are you not going to be uprooted? Are you, are you going to be able to live here? Or are the Ammonites and Moabites going to drive you out? Are the Philistines going to drive you out? You're not really settled. Only when I establish Melucha, already here in Shmuel Bet, God makes it very clear. When you have melucha, and melucha means that you have a son after you die, when you have a house, who yivne bayit lishmi? Vechonanti et kisei mamlachto ad olam. Ani heyelo la'av, hu yali lebein. He will be my son. When you have a house, v'neeman beitcha umamlachtcha ad olam lefanecha. So in the book of Shmuel, only until you have a house, meaning an established melucha political system, which in those days, there was no such thing as Jeffersonian democracy. That wasn't a live option. The only options are shoftim or melucha, monarchy or something else. When you have that. And then the second half of the parak says, David gives this beautiful prayer. Vatiktan od zot beinecha vatidaber gam el beit avdecha lemeirachok. You spoke to my house from the past. And Mik Amcha Yisrael, and then he says, You established me on my bait. David. You've told me, you've promised me that Beit Avdecha David will be established. Nachon. I will build you a house. And therefore, when you, when I have a house, then I will be able to do, I will build the house to the Rabboni Shalom. So it's very clear in the book of Shmuel, this insight that before you have, when you have a house, i.e. a Hemshechiyut, then you can build a house, which of course is exactly what happens in the beginning of the book of Kings. What happens in the beginning of the book of Kings? The first three, four chapters are the, first of all, the death of David and the working out of who exactly is going to be the heir to the throne, who is going to continue David's line and the Davidic line. Shlomo HaMelech is established, to use the words of the book of Shmuel, which are basically cut and pasted in the book of Malachim. Vayihi Nachon Kiso, his how his, his, um, his throne is established and firm. That's the first three, four chapters of the Book of Kings. What happens after that? After that, we have a couple of narratives about Shlomo HaMelech's great wisdom. And immediately, Shlomo HaMelech begins to build the Beis HaMikdash. From chapter 5 through chapter 10, the bulk of the narrative of Shlomo is the building of his own house and the building of the house of God. So until you have a house, then you can have a house. And it's exactly what Chazal say. Chazal in a very famous Gemara, because it emerges from Tanakh. Like so many Chazal, they just don't always play it out the way we do. Chazal say in the famous Gemara in Sanhedrin, Shlosha mitzvot nitztavu Yisrael b'knisatan la'aretz. 
the Jewish people were commanded to do three mitzvot. One was lahamid melech, to set up a kingship, a monarchy. Number two was livnot bayit lahashem. And number three was lahachrit zaro shel amalek, to destroy the Amalekites, which is, of course, the downfall of Saul, as opposed to King David. After the end of the book of Shmuel Aleph, there are no more Amalekites. The Amalekites, which are symbolically killed by David in Shmuel Bet, Perak Aleph, when the Nar HaAmaleki comes and tells him about the death, the lad, the Amalekite lad, tells him about the death of Saul. David is the one who kills the Amalekites. David is the one who we no longer in the second book of Shmuel, there are no Amalekites that are, threaten the stability of Am Yisrael, okay? Eventually, there's going to be other foes, but there are no more Amalekites that we meet with David after the story of Tziklag at the end of Shmuel Aleph and the killing of the Nar HaAmaleki, the, the, the lad, and the beginning of Shmuel Bet. And now that we establish, we, we destroyed Amalek, from the perspective of the narrative, the biblical narrative. Again, I'm not interested in whether there actually were Amalekites left. The point is that from the perspective, the prophetic perspective of the book of Samuel and the second book of Samuel and Kings, Amalek is not a threat anymore, and nor is are they a factor anymore in the biblical narrative. From then on, we can now begin to establish the Malucha, and then we establish the Beit Hashem, the Beit HaMikdash. That is why the book of Kings, I asked a simple question, but I gave a long answer because it's foundational. That's why the book of Kings begins where it begins and doesn't begin in the middle of Shmuel Bet. And now it also makes perfect sense the way the book begins and ends. The book begins and ends in the same place. The book begins with the establishment of the Davidic line and the building of the Beis Mikdash. Where does this book end? This book could have ended at many different places throughout Jewish history, okay? The book is clearly written looking back, right? Because the last episodes in this book are about the destruction of the temple. And a couple of years after the destruction of the temple, what happened to King Yehoiachin, who's sitting in exile, right? So the book basically ends with the destruction of the two houses that we spoke about, right? The book begins with the house of David being established, and then it talks about the house of God being established. The book ends where the house of God is destroyed and the house of David is destroyed. How is it destroyed? It's destroyed because the last king of Judah, and here is a very important point. Again, I said this is tonight is a lot of uh, introductory material, uh, which I'm just reminding you of things that I'm sure you know, but or not know, but uh, it's important to put on the table. Malchut Yehuda, the Davidic dynasty of Judah, they had a lot of very negative people in it. As I mentioned to you, hereditary uh, transmission of power does not ensure that you're going to get a great tzaddik to be the king. All it ensures is stability, that you know, right? Just like in America, we think, we thought, until 2020, we thought that democracy means the peaceful transfer of power and everything will be great because even if we don't have great, but we know it's not like some third world country where every time uh, a king or a, or a, a potentate or a, a potentate or a, a strong man dies, there's all this, you know, who's going to take over in the Politburo. There's a clear line of succession. The same thing with, in the ancient world, monarchy. There was a certain clear line of succession. Malchut Beit David, for all its negative characters, is from the beginning of the Book of Kings until the end of the Book of Kings, it's ben achar ben achar ben achar ben. 
It's son after son after son. There are no coups, C-O-U-P, right? It's a French word, right, Jay? It's a French word, coup, right? I think so. I don't know. I'm not sure, actually. In Canada, they're supposed to know. I live in Toronto. I got to ask them. You don't have to know. Okay. Okay. So, So there are no coups. As much as there is an uninterrupted line from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, Who's the last king of Israel? The last king of Israel that's mentioned in this book is Tzidkiyahu. Tzidkiyahu is the first guy who is not Ben Achar Ben. He is not the son of Yehoiachin. He is the brother of Yehoiachin. So it's a fascinating thing. The book ends where the house ends. When the house ends, the book ends. When the house of God ends, the book ends. When the house of David ends, the book ends. The book begins with the house of David established. The book ends with the house of David ended. The book begins with the house of Hashem being built. And the book ends with the house of Hashem being destroyed. Okay. Um, let's continue with a couple of more important um, introductory comments uh, to this book. Um, I use the word Book of Kings, say for Malachim, uh, for those who like Latin, Regnum, or whatever it's called, um, the Book of Regents. Um, but there is no such thing as Malachim Bet and Malachim Aleph. That is a, an invention of the, of the Septuagint. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, there's Shmuel, there's Malachim, and there's Divrei Hayamim. There's no Shmuel Aleph, Shmuel Bet, Malachim Aleph, Malachim Bet. It's all one long book. The Septuagint, probably for reasons that they thought the book was too long. They didn't like books that were so long. They divide the book. It's a very strange way they divide the book. Um, I mean, it's not so strange, but it is interesting that the book could have been divided um, with the death of Eliyahu. But for some reason, they put that in Malachim Bet, Perak Bet, when they, when Eliyahu goes up to Shemaim, up to heaven. Uh, but and that's where they divided it. Uh, why do we use it? It's just an accident of history. Because um, when the first uh, printer printing was printed, it was not controlled by Jews, as you know. Printing was not originally controlled by Jews. And therefore, um, they followed whatever the Septuagint that had been adapted by the Christians in terms of dividing uh, the books. And so it just became uh, the standard use. Okay, from the beginning of this book until the end of this book, pass about uh, 450 uh, years or so. According to most scholars, again, you don't hold me to the exact you know, year or decade, but basically the death of David, you know, reign of, of, of Shlomo HaMelech, you're talking about around... 1000 BCE, 980 BCE, till the destruction of the temple, which we accept as the accepted date, 586 BCE. Um, and a cup, and the last mention of at the end of the book discusses the fact, again, if we put it on, again, if you look at the very end of the book of, um, of Melachim, so if we look at the very end of the Book of Kings, so we know um, we talk about the, that Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar comes and destroys the temple. And then at the very end, uh, it talks about they took them into exile. And we have the story of Gedalia and the, what we, the assassination of Gedalia, which we know becomes Tzom Gedalia. And the very last story in the book is went into exile in uh, you know uh, about uh, in 598 about 12 13 years before the destruction so 37 years after the destruction after the galut of Yehoyachin. so 586 minus 37 is about uh, 550. So it says 
בשנים עשר חודש ב-27 לחודש נסע ומרוח את ראש היחין מבית הכלא וידבר איתו טובות וייתן את כיסו מעל כיסא המלכים ושינה את בגדי כלאו and he started to give him all started to treat him better so that the book ends on a little bit of a positive note that there was some hint so we're talking about about 420 450 years that elapse in this book um, as many have noted notice that the book could have ended on a much happier note which was of course the Cyrus declaration which takes place about 20 years later but it doesn't mention the Cyrus declaration Hatsarat Koresh because it hadn't happened yet this book seems to have been written or certainly the um, or and the author uh, the simple reading is that the author uh, was writing um, looking back at the debacle that unfortunately happened in Jewish history uh, started with great hopes and great but it ended with a great destruction um, and the the book um, ends from that perspective about 550 looking back on what happened in the last 450 years Chazal of course the rabbis believed that the person who wrote the book was Yirmiyahu the book the prophet Jeremiah which is very possible it's not a crazy idea because certainly Jeremiah lived through the Churban lived through the destruction and was certainly capable of looking back uh, historiographically and writing a book that described uh, certainly the events uh, that had happened in the last 400 uh, and, uh, and 50 uh, years. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about um, the uh, structure of this book. Um, and of course, uh, and, and talk about um, the, you know, the basic theme of the book. The book is not a prophetic book in the classical sense, meaning when we talk about, let's say, the book of Yeshayahu or Yirmiyahu, the book of Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel, that's what we call classical prophecy, where you have the prophets who we know and love and gave the famous speeches that are, you know, ins inscribed on the Isaiah wall and in the hearts of, of people, and Martin Luther King quoted them. <laughs> and those are the famous speeches. That, but those speeches, they start uh, in the middle of the eighth century, 750, okay, uh, onwards, those great classical prophets. The, the, the first half of the book, um, basically from 950 to 750, takes us um, in the early period of prophecy, uh, where there are prophets, there's no doubt that there are prophets, but their theme is very different. Um, as opposed to Yeshayahu Yirmiyahu, who focus a lot uh, on what we would call social social justice, uh, the Averot of a society that's become corrupt, uh, full of wealth and taking advantage of people uh, and the lower rungs of society, uh, whatever those are defined, depending on the society. Uh, the, the first 200 years, of Sefer Malachim focuses entirely on Avodah Zarah. There's very, very little, except for the one or two chapters in Eliyahu and the Elijah narratives that talk about um, the, the story of Kerem Navot, of the terrible story of, of uh, the murder of Navot and taking his Kerem, taking his vineyard. Um, the focus is almost entirely, at least the, hysteria, the historiography, the theory of history that's outlined in the book of Malachim is almost totally about Avodah Zarah, about idolatry, that what got them into trouble, what got the kings, especially the kings, again, it focuses very much on the leadership. And of course, as you know, um, it, the, the book likes to give a kind of standard uh, as we're going to, once we leave the Shlomo HaMelech narrative at the beginning, the book will have a kind of standard outline of the king. We'll talk about the year the king ascended to the throne, the length of his reign. Uh, we'll talk about when, what age he was, and sometimes who his mother was. Um, and then we'll have a, 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 a report card. Vayas hara b'nei Hashem, vayas hato b'nei Hashem, vayas hara achlo, but he wasn't, he was bad, but he wasn't as bad as this one. And this one is good. He's almost as good as this one, meaning there's a kind of very, very standard uh, tropes of how the king is presented. 
in this context. And again, when you judge or didn't do did he do the right? It's almost always in the context of Avodah Zarah, of, um, of idolatry and how uh, it plays out in terms of idolatry. Okay, now um, the final point of um, introduction, uh, just want to talk about the outline and structure of this book. So many people um, very famously like to divide this book. Well, no, uh, also just one couple of other introductory materials, and then we'll talk about the structure of the book. Um, the timing, as I said, it's about 450 years. Sometimes the chronologies are not perfectly synced. And when we get to some of the some of the details, we'll talk about it. Some of that has to do with the fact that there's overlap of years. There's an important point, what we call, what we today would call co-regents, um, that they are not like regents of, you know, like <laughs> taking the regents in New York City or New York State, but co-regent, they were kings at the same time. Sometimes when you have these very long reigns, you know, this king was, was king for 40 years, this king was king for 50 years, it also means that the son started to be king already when the person was still, right? So like, for example, when they're going to write the history of Queen Elizabeth, so they're going to say she reigned for what? What did she reign for? 60 years, 70 years, whatever it was. But the last 10 years of her life, you know, she wasn't doing as much as she did 30 years ago, right? Charles was doing things and... And Prince William was doing things, and they were, and, you know, and obviously Harry and Meghan weren't doing things because they kicked them out, right? So whatever. But the point is that there was overlap. So in name, yeah, Queen Elizabeth reigned for seventy years, but she wasn't mamish, you know, doing the same, really reigning in the same way. She wasn't going on trips all over the world for the last 10, 15 years. She wasn't doing X, Y, Z in the same way. So the same thing. You're, we're going to see that there is a certain amount of overlap of certain kings from the beginning to the end, which may explain uh, some of the some of the problematics that we are going to see in terms of the of the dating. Um, and you know, we're also obviously there's going to be all kinds of small issues like sometimes a king stops reigning in the middle of the year. So do you consider that? the last year, the first year of the new king. You know, again, there's all these little small issues of dating, which some people like to get very, very much uh, involved in. The other thing I just want to mention in passing before uh, our final discussion about the structure of the book is we're going to, from time to time, look at the book of Chronicles, the Divrei Hayamim, and compare certain stories. Um, and we're going to sometimes see um, gaps and differences between the book of Chronicles and the book of Malachim. One of the major differences, which many have pointed to, is the book of Chronicles um, is almost, almost exclusively about Yehuda. It doesn't talk about so much the kings of Israel. So it's very focused on Yehuda. Number two, in contrast to the book of Kings um, and Shmuel, um, while the book of Shmuel and the book of Kings is very honest portrayal of all the kings, warts and all, good things, bad things, etc. The book of Chronicles is much more, as they say in Hebrew, megamati. It's much more, has an agenda. And the agenda, as many people have noted, is to put as bet, best light as possible on Malchei Yehuda, on the kings of Judea. Um, so, for example, the entire narrative of David and Bathsheba and the sin of David does not appear in the book of Chronicles. I mean, that's a major episode that just is ignored in the book of Chronicles. And a number of people have noted that part of that is very clear. Um, while the book of Kings is written right after the Chorban, probably in order to, so to speak, give a prophetic take on what led to this terrible destruction. How did we go from this great height of the Beis Hamikdash and Davidic dynasty and the great potential to the total destruction and exile? So it is going to focus on everything, including the warts 
of even the greatest of the pro of the kings in order to say, yeah, but look how they messed up, which led to the Chorban, which led to the destruction. And even when we tried to do Tshuva, it was too late because it was the end of the fourth quarter and we were down by 25. We weren't down by five. And so we couldn't come back, etc. cetera. Um, in contrast, the book of Chronicles um, is written from the perspective of of uh, Hatsarat Koresh. We're talking already at the time of great um, anticipation of that maybe, or, or later, that you know that the Jewish people are returning, the Israelites are returning to the land of Israel, even in limited circumstances. There was a great deal of hope that the Davidic dynasty would be rebuilt and restored. And so therefore the agenda of the book of Chronicles is much different. It wants to present the Davidic dynasty in the best light in order to be able to reestablish the Davidic dynasty and give hope and inspiration to the generation that's now in Persia, in Bavel, and is going to Emir Tzashem, they hope, will be able to restore um, the, the Davidic future, the Davidic dynasty. Finally tonight, I'd like to speak, as I said, about the structure of this book. So this book generally is divided by most into three parts. The first part um, is seen as the reign of Shlomo from Perak Aleph through Perak Yud Aleph. So that's the stories of Shlomo. Um, then we have from the middle part of the book, from Perak Yud Aleph, from chapter, I'm sorry, Perak Yud Bet, from chapter 12 of, of Kings 1, through uh, chapter 17 of Kings 2, <clears throat> which describes the schism and the break of the kingdoms into <clears throat> a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, Malchut um, Yisrael, the Israelite kingdom, and Malchut Yehuda, the Judean kingdom, uh, or in other terms, Malchut Shomron, Shomron, which was the capital, one of the capitals of the northern tribes, and Malchut Yehuda, Judea, up until the destruction of the northern tribes, which, according to most scholars, takes place in 722 BCE by the Assyrian kingdom. Um, and then the last part of the book, from um, the destruction of the of the northern tribes, from Malachim Bet, Perak Yudchet, until the end of the book, Perak Chafhei, which describes the last kings of Judea and the ultimate downfall of Judea. That's the way many people uh, divide it. Others, um, scholars uh, and uh, non-Jewish scholars, Jewish scholars have taken a little bit of a different approach. So let me, um, let me just, uh, let me share. Sorry, let me put this one away and let me share um, this. So, a different, a different. What was the last one again? I'm sorry. The last one would be the classical approach would say that from Melachim Bet Perak Yudchet, from Kings two chapter eighteen to Perak Chavay chapter twenty five is simply the mirror image of the beginning of the book. We're talking about the end of the uh, of the Judean dynasty with the um, the last kings of Judah, Chizkiyahu, uh, Yoshiahu, Yehoiachin. Sidkiyahu. Um, a little bit more of a sophisticated uh, division of the book, uh, as you can see in front of you, would argue the following, that it's really a little bit of a chiastic structure with the middle, chiastic A, B, C, C, B, A, uh, with something in the middle, sometimes it's in the middle, sometimes not. So the first part of the book would be Shlomo and the United Monarchy. Um, which is the same. Then from B would be the splitting of the monarchy, the Northern Kingdom. Then you have the kings, uh, stories about the kings of Judah and Israel. Then in the middle, you have the stories of Elijah and, Eli and Elisha. I don't know what I wrote, Eliasha, Elisha. Um, so Elisha, of course, uh, Elijah and Elisha are the great prophets who unfortunately are not very, ultimately are not successful. And that's the main, main thing that you focus on. They're not successful in trying to bring the people away from Avodah Zarah. They have temporary successes, but very, very 
ultimately the people continue to serve the Baal, the Baal god, we'll talk about what the Baal is, and other gods. Uh, and then basically you have a mirror image of that because right after the death of Elisha, we have a couple of more stories about the kings of Judah and Israel. And then we have the fall of the Northern Kingdom and ultimately the fall of the Kingdom of Judah. So we have a united monarchy here too. We have a united monarchy, but it's united because there's no other monarchy. There's no Northern Kingdom anymore. So, um, so it's a kind of mirror image of each other, which again highlights the work of the prophets who try to work on a, you know, convincing the people that their political future is totally dependent on their religious future and how they connect to God. That's what will ultimately allow them to remain in the land of Israel and not. So this was the uh, introduction uh, to the book of Kings. Uh, we covered, um, I think we covered, I think most of what I want, I think almost everything I wanted to cover in terms of the introduction. Uh, I don't think it's uh, at 926, it makes sense to begin uh, chapter one. So Mir Hashem, uh, next week, uh, we will begin chapter one. So next week we have a regular class. The week after that, we have a regular class. November the 16th, Wednesday, November 16th, we have no class uh, because um, I have um, uh, parent-teachers conferences that I, I'm, I teach at SAR and that having one of them uh, during the course of the semester is always on a Wednesday. So um, that week is a good week to do Chazara uh, to review uh, everything that we're going to be have done in the last four weeks, and then we'll pick it up again. Rabbi Kelman, the semester goes through when? Uh, this this is ongoing. So uh, I don't know if you want to copy what I do in my sitter class. I started it last year, right after Simcha's term. We haven't missed a Friday since. So uh, you know, okay. we don't Beautiful. we do Torah Hiketa Bo Yom and Valila. We do every week. So, so we'll, yes, you're, we'll, if you want to go to take a break though, go to Israel. Yeah, I may, I may Christmas the only time, break, whatever, the only break I might take is in February, just because I um I watch McCall. I uh, Probably will fly to Israel. But of so. course, of course. No, the advantage of an ongoing class really is that you don't have to rush to finish. Exactly. Something. That's that's the that's when Rabbi Help kind of mentioned at the beginning. He asked me, you know, we can go this sort of through the year, and I said, absolutely. Yeah. So we'll we'll go at the pace, however long it takes. It takes, and uh, you yeah. know, one day we'll make a scene when everybody will order some, you know, pizza, and we'll celebrate, and uh, that'll be very nice. Or we'll all come, okay. Rabbi Kelman. I think we should think about reestablishing a yo the Yom Iyun B'Tanach that was Yes, in I did for many, many. Listen, like I said, a lot of people ask. We haven't done really live programming in Toronto in, right. you know, almost three, whatever, two and a half. February 20th, our last two speakers were actually Michelle Farber. It was right after Daf Yomi had finished. And, we, you know, she sure. did the Hadron. We had her in. And actually... Um, and David Silver, they came two weeks apart, the end of February 2020. COVID right. hit, obviously, everything got, uh, you know, yeah. changed. And then we were have been doing stuff on Zoom. I think people may know, may not really know, you know, you know, Mark Shapiro had given the 150 classes on Zoom already before. We had other classes on Zoom. Rabbi Help got a top. It, it wasn't on Zoom. We weren't doing it on Zoom. We were doing it on another platform. And then right. we pivoted. And then uh, slowly now, so people have asked. So that's what I said. Somebody approached me a couple of weeks ago. Yes, your say, can I bring in a speaker on November 12th? So I said, sure. And we started our trip. So uh, we'll do both. Uh, but uh, yes, we used to do a Yom Iyun every year on Tanakh in Toronto. It was not broadcast, but they're all on. Uh, you can listen to them on our website. Anyway. Okay, okay Rabbi Nadi, just, we can that. I'm, yeah, yeah. You go. I also, this this page of structure of Sefer Malachim, I also did in a Google Doc, which I'm going to share with everybody on the um you know, and you send email it to us, we'll post it on the website because that's okay. much easier for him. Okay. People who listen afterwards, it'll be posted on the website. That's always the best, the sources. Okay, Thank great. You. Okay, tomorrow, <laughs> Shulia Mishkin, of course, is beginning her new series on uh, history of Yerushalayim. Always, always fasting. That's tomorrow at 12 noon. Um, I will, j just for those, I don't think anybody's in Israel now, but, you know, next week, 
Uh, Israel changes the clock. This week we change a week later, but all we spoke to all our speakers. We're going to be on Eastern time next week, so the regular time. But tomorrow, Shuli's at 12 p.m. Eastern, um, 8.30 tomorrow night, a regular Parshir. Leah Silver will be giving the Parshir Shir. Um, I'll be giving my regular class on the sitters. You heard 9.30 on Friday morning. Uh, Sunday morning, Rabbi Liptag is starting a new series on Ger, uh, what Ger means in Chumash and their attitude towards Gerim, so that the, you know, strangers or and converts, that starts this Sunday. And Monday, Mark Shapiro, after 23-part series, he's uh, on the um, sort of the stage one and two of the, the rabbinic response to reform is going to be starting kind of a new series on the p positive historical school of, of Zachariah Frankel. Is it or is it not the beginning of conservative Judaism? Of course, we're talking 19th century reactions to reform. I don't know how much people know about, on Zachariah Frankel, but uh, Mark's always fascinating. So that's this Monday night starting a new series on uh, at 8.30 p.m. And then all this series started this week. Nava Finkelman, um, et cetera, et cetera. We'll, I just uh, will be continuing Rabbi Shulman, Sefer Daniel, Grappling with God we had, had, had today. So uh, we look forward to learning with you. And like I say, always invite a friend, bring a friend and, uh, and spread the word. And uh, we can have Torah online, live, everywhere. And I uh, want to thank you all for coming. And everybody have a lovely night. And Lailo Tov, and we'll see you soon. Okay, thank Rabbi, you. Rabbi, have... Rabbi Helfgott, another proof for you that Bayat means sort of like dynasty is Shifra and Pua. Yeah, of course. No, I don't. I, it's, it's, it's right. It's, it's all over the, it's all over Tanakh. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Have a good night, everybody. Okay. Lila Tov. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.